<laughs> three second, three minutes late. All right, cool. Um, hi everyone. Bit of a slow start because the projector resolution didn't like my Linux laptop, which was running a Windows VM. So thankfully to Dave Lewis, I'm running his Mac, and we can do all the things to it. So since I'm a little bit late, let's skip ahead. Hopefully you're all here to see fishing for the shell. If you're not, probably next next door. But thank you for coming at uh, 11 in the morning. Uh, there was an open bar, so hopefully you're not too hungover. Typical InfoSec conference. So let's get to it. A little bit of who am I, since you are uh, seeing a talk by me. You want to know that I'm somewhat credible. I am a little bit, I hope. I'm a security consultant at KPMG Canada. I've spoken at B-Size TO, which is Toronto, Salt Lake City, Vegas, uh, Circle City Con, Hackfest. I, I do enjoy presenting and helping people learn. I am mostly focused on offensive security and purple teaming. And to humanize me, I go to the gym. So when girls are like, what do you do for fun? I'm like the gym and coding and stuff. Like, yeah. So. What are we going to go through in this talk? Uh, I have a high amount of data information, but it's a 40 minute talk, not 50 or an hour. So I'm going to cut through the crap. So one, what is phishing? The different phishing types for engagements, clicking, creds, and shells. The email minefield, because when you get a shell, it's different to just clicking. Uh, what I did to learn phishing, what does it involve, and what did it require? So why phishing? Why should you care about phishing? Obviously, uh, uh, who's a blue team in here? Anyone? One person? Red team? You're not blue team. Yes. But you all know why phishing. It's successful, it's popular, it causes a lot of havoc. And I just put some stupid URL to say, hey, it's real. So the top 10 internet scams that I quickly Googled were phishing emails and phony web pages. The Nigerian 419 scam, which everyone knows. Lottery scams, advance fees for guaranteed loan or credit card, that lovely email you need to pay, you forgot to pay ones. Uh, just a funny story on this, I've actually had a relative fall to that Windows scam where they call up and say, hey, you've got a virus, please go to this website. And she paid, unfortunately, which sucks. Anyone else had, know someone who's fallen to a scam like that? No, we're all smart, yep. So, phishing examples. Uh, you all know the email, the Gmail one that came through as the uh, Google Docs one. This isn't that. This is just an example of an email fish. And the URL is there if you want to look it up later. Uh, John LaTWC on Twitter is the Microsoft guy for threat intelligence, and he posts all these phishing examples, obviously related to Microsoft Word. So we have Excel, and it pops up with the Windows security dialog, which is pretty cool. Uh, they also pretend to be antivirus, so McAfee secure with the Windows security thing. Bit of a pain in the A. I'm not sure how many fall for them, but obviously they do and they're quite popular. There's this pretty cool one I found randomly while Googling. It's, uh, it, it manipulates the URL to have the data text slash HTML before it, and it can make it look like a full Google URL that has JavaScript in it. And uh, if you want to look at that, it's pretty pretty cool. So, four minutes, awesome. I can slow down now. The phishing engagement types, like if you're at a place that wants phishing done or you want to do some phishing, there's three main types of engagements. There's counting clicks, gathering credentials, and then gaining command and control. You know, when you pop the shell and you're like, yes, interpreter session one opened, that's the one. So counting clicks is what you think it is. You uh, send an email, and someone clicks the link, and you <coughs> count the click. So if you sent, let's do some basic maths, 100 emails and 10 people clicked, that's a 10% click-through rate. That's great for 101 security awareness. Has anyone had that type of phishing engagement in their organization? Yep, was it fun? Did you get in trouble for clicking the link? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know one went through government in Canada recently, and it was just like a fax. And a friend of mine clicked it, and she was like, well, it could have been important. So there's a bit of 
psychological and pretexting. And then generally after you click it, it'll have a website saying, oh, you could have clicked a really bad link. Please learn security or something. So when you do counting clicks, you'll typically, like MySpace, have your page number that counts who clicks. And this is an example of stupid clicky things. But So there's those counting clicks. And how do you count clicks? You can have one of those numbers, which is just a little Apple widget that they call it on those uh, free website builders. Or you can do it in the background and have PHP code just count who it is, write to a text file and increment by one. Simple PHP code if you guys want to build your own later. Now this idea of gathering credentials is one step further than counting a link. So they'll ask, they'll fish the company, like the OWA 365 or something, or in this case, the example is from Australia, which is where I'm from, hence a funny accent. But the, the government created a government portal where you can do all your government stuff, in, similar to MySIC, which is a Canadian one, which you guys aren't from, so that's probably irrelevant. Anyhow, they made a phishing one where they asked for your passport front and back. So I thought that was pretty clever because they do a lot of uh, click jacking, I think, on bank websites and they ask for your credit card number and the uh, code on the back. So this one, which is uh, pretty cool. So gathering credentials would be also your uh, VPN connection, things like that. So you click an email, you pretext a user to type in their credentials, which is really pretty cool. But, oh no, is it broke? No, it did broke. Okay. So there's some issues with gathering credentials, such as having to reset passwords. If you get 100 employees' passwords, you're going to have to tell the client, and they're going to have to do a massive reset. So it's the same thing with clients preferring a VA to a pen test. It's safer and checks the box. And then wherever your data is stored, you really need to protect it because you could expose all the passwords. So then we get to command and control. Do people know what a shell is? Yes, no? So the two main types of shells is a synchronous shell, which is like data back and forwards directly, instantly. There's two, such as a reverse and bind shell. Then there's the more advanced APT low and slow shells, which are asynchronous. So that would be similar to Beacon or the Empire agent that uh, people are probably aware of. Um, yep. So basically, command and control is where you're the hacker in a ninja suit, you bypass the firewall or the, the perimeter, and you get code execution on someone's computer. Pretty cool. So the issues with that, with any pen test or red team, for example, is that you might get hacked yourself, your attack infrastructure. Someone might hijack that control and then hack the client in a real hack. Uh, if you run unencrypted communications, you probably shouldn't do that because, again, they can sniff the data. And then you're exfiltrating data out the network. So there's all these issues with companies not wanting to get fished for command and control. It's just th some things you have to take into consideration. And then I just wanted to put more picture of command and control, like the cloud, because that's a buzzword. And then IoT, with your kettle and Bluetooth and whatever, or the um, baby cam monitors that the other talk was talking about. So we've gone through the phishing types. Why do we need to worry about phishing? Because it's so popular. And command and control. And now we're going to get to the email minefield. So when you do phishing for clicks, you're really just going to a website and counting the click. That's generally fine. There's not really any, unless your domain is blacklisted, it's pretty much guaranteed to work. So this email minefield is helping you realize and learn what actually is required of you and your tools and payloads to get back out of that network. So my, I can't highlight the slides, but at the top left in yellow, there's the sender policy framework. There's the mail antivirus gateway. Then there's host antivirus. Then there's the intrusion detection system to get past. And then once you've done all that, Got to get out the egress and firewall somehow. And then you're successful, which is really cool. So this, I have to uh, 
shout out to him. Uh, Raphael Mudge from Cobalt Strike, him, that author, he created this. The link's at the bottom, so I, I didn't make this up. Uh, so you get to the sender policy framework. What does that mean? This is just a bit where they ensure you're not spam and you're not like, oh, I'm going to pre pretend to be Google or Microsoft and, you know, it, it t takes away that real easy, obvious attempt at phishing. So the SPF record is a way for a list of authorizing sending hosts for a domain to record who can actually send the email and prevent spoofers. And I just added a few uh, wiki links for you to look up. The other note is that a lot of people will use a non-deliver notice to sort of read within the metadata of the email what protection, who it's from, just more information to help you conduct a fish or an attack. So mail, you, once you bypass the sender policy framework and you're actually allowed and approved to send an email, you then hit the mail antivirus. So these can be as simple as a sandbox, or sorry, advanced as a sandbox, or just simple attachment scanning. So basically, you are able to send the email and it gets checked whether it's malicious or not. And in a sandbox, sometimes I actually execute the uh, payload like a sandbox uh, antivirus on the host. So Google would be the perfect example. They just run antivirus scanning attachments, and then what happens when viruses are found? They email doesn't get sent. And if you're doing a phishing campaign, you don't want your uh, email to get detected at that stage. It really sucks. So to bypass this, or in your own environment, if you're going to purple team, red team yourself, all the buzzwords, you're going to test with different files. So kernel ownage has a tool which allows different file names, such as bat, cmd, file types, executables, obviously blocked by uh, Gmail instantly, and then JavaScript as well. And then I think the other talk was talking about JavaScript and how users are actually allowed to execute that in a, from an email. So we're not really helping our users when we don't limit what they can actually click on. So with this uh, minefield, a lot of noobs or script kiddies will be like, yes, I delivered the email, got the payload in there. Yay, done. That's awesome. We're all done now, right? Good job. But wait, there's more, as, as I showed before, right? The payload needs to execute and actually run and then try to get out to you. So at this point, we've bypassed the sender policy framework, the mail antivirus with like using some JavaScript or running something hidden in a zip file, uh, and then you get your message delivered. So, so then we get to the host antivirus, which I think we all know. We see the little pop-ups at work, AVG or Avast or whatever McAfee enterprise one you have. It's all the brands. Uh, does anyone's antivirus help block anything? No, it's really easy to bypass, but they make a lot of money from it. So to run it in memory, uh, sorry, to bypass it, you can run things in memory. Uh, the new fileless PowerShell malware isn't actually fileless. It does drop something. But anyhow, you've got to use PowerShell, run in memory, perhaps a DLL, things like that. Also, if you're going to use Mimikatz or a known, known tool on GitHub, you'll want to go and remove all those type of signature-based detections, such as Mimikatz such as PowerShell comments in the code. And there's actually a good uh, article there which goes through it and shows you some regex for stripping that out. It's really pretty cool. So then once you've bypassed host antivirus, you get coded execution. That's really awesome. You've been able to send the email. You've got it by bypassed the antivirus, the mail antivirus. You've delivered the email. That's fantastic. It's running on the host. That's awesome. All done. No. There's even more. <clears throat> so this is where I like to think of the pen test part, because you know when you do a network pen test, you get your first shell on some machine, and you're like, yes, but it gets stripped off by AV. This is the real pen test part. So it's your first landing. Uh, you might encounter whitelisting or PowerShell constrained language mode. So get in the box with emails. That's great. But now this is what I like to term as the email privilege escalation. 
so we've got the code execution running. We now need to get out the network. So you've got your IDS, your IPS, things like that, and intrusion detection and whatnot run on signature mode, the most basics. Next gen might run on anomaly, and they're passive or active. So passive being they don't do anything if they just give you an alert if they detect something wrong. Whereas active, if they detect a bad domain or something fishy going on, they might drop the connection, block that domain automatically. So it all depends on how advanced it is. And then you have to get out the firewall, the correct egress, the right port, things like that. <coughs> oh, I didn't move the slide, but this is your IDS for your NIDs, your HIDs, your signature and anomaly. And then th these guys aren't that easy to bypass depending on your client's setup and how aware they are. So like the target hack, the first one decades ago, they got in and there were alerts, but because they were so overloaded with alerts, they didn't do anything. So you could try that. Um, you have to be worried about bypassing intranet proxies as well. So you might have to supply credentials. And then you want to obfuscate your uh, your payloads, like the PowerShell payload, things like that. And there's also the idea of creating false negatives. So you can just create different traffic and then slide your real attack under the radar, hopefully. And then there's things like URL encoding and HTML encoding and different types of unicoding encoding for different payloads. So it's pretty cool. And then once you pass the IDS, you have your firewall to bypass, which I'm not sure if you guys have all seen the memes, like the one with the the door and it's like, do not enter, and you just walk past, straight, uh, straight past it, things like that. Has anyone attempted to bypass a firewall before? No? Okay. It's, um, I don't think it's really much of a problem for phishing or pen testing, but it is something to be uh, aware of in this email minefield. So the firewalls will be your generally a bastion host. All traffic sort of goes through that one to get checked. Uh, might be in your DMZ. It might have deep packet inspection, might reassemble packets as its next gen firewall 2050 or something. So you've not been detected by IDS. Now you've got your firewall, which is good. You pass the big bad boss known as a firewall. How do you do that? Well, with a firewall, you can attempt to fragment traffic, break it up. So, for example, in an Nmap scan, you can do fragmentation to bypass WAFs or WIF, website application firewalls, things like that. You can then tunnel ice traffic through the ICMP protocol or the HTTP protocol. I believe Beacon has a DNS one, which is pretty sick. Uh, the PowerShell Empire agents are As well are pretty good. You can encrypt your traffic, so if the firewall doesn't have deep packet inspection, which it should, it'll get past that way. You can also conduct firewalking as well. And then there, I actually watched a cyber video to see if it was any decent. It was decent to the point where it showed you the different items, but it didn't go technical enough to show you exactly what firewalking is. So you might have to do some more googling on that. And then once we've had out the firewall, at the very end of the client's environment, we have our lovely shell, which is fantastic. Which means, as you're a ninja attacker, you've got through all those squares. You send a policy framework, you're, you're allowed to send the email, your email's actually been delivered because it's been, um, they've decided it's not malicious. You've then bypassed the host antivirus, which means you can then execute code and then you bypass the IDS and firewall, which means, oh, it's just normal traffic out, out the hole and to the cloud you go. <coughs> so phishing mechanics. Uh, I wanted to learn phishing, and we need to understand what phishing is and the different types of engagement, and we then need to bypass the email uh, minefield. So what does that involve with phishing? In a nutshell, what do we need to do? We have to create a domain. We have to send an email and deliver an email because phishing is all about the emails. We need to then social engineer someone to click a link, click a download, or if you're gathering credentials, type something in, things like that. Or with your macros, click like 10 different things to allow the macros to run. 
So from that, we need to social engineer them to interact, download the payload, and execute it, which might be a double click or something. So then, in a nutshell, we need to send the email, deliver it, socially engineer interaction, and receive a shell. Nice and simple, but it's not because I just showed you the email minefield. So the considerations I took when uh, learning to fish was you need to build a convincing email. So all in social engineering, you have your pretexting, your story. So you need to recon the uh, organization and learn all about them, which you probably can do in your one-on-one pen testing class. But we also need to build a website that is convincing or use a framework. So that can be a framework or a manual. You need to bypass the email minefield. So there's actually a couple of steps before getting to the email minefield. You need to then understand the payloads and the different user interaction. So the idea here is, say, as a pen tester or even as a blue teamer, you need to understand the things you're going to use and play with them in like a test environment. Because I don't want to send an email, them to click the link, then to have to click through five different things to execute my code. And by that time, they're going to be like, yeah, this is a fish. Let's, let's get rid of this. So you need to practice. So this talk was all about the uh, phishing email. Uh, so the phishing campaign and then showing you guys what it is, how I learned. So basically, to start off with, when you want to learn something, what do you do? You hit the Twitters and you hit Google. So I reached out to Twitter because we have such an amazing community on the Twitters, hashtag InfoSec. Uh, how many of you guys are on the Twitters or Twitter, have a Twitter account? Most of you. Those that aren't, I would really suggest you get a Twitter account because there's so many cool people to connect with, like myself. No, there's Snow, there's JC, there's uh, people at the back, and sorry, I forgot your Twitter account. <laughs> I, I know the picture is, but the ads, you just do automatically. But there's just so many people to reach out with. All the tool creators will uh, help you with advice. I had one, Gabriel Ryan, <laughs> I was doing Wi-Fi engagement, and one of the Python EAP hammer broke, and he fixed it that morning for me, which was, I thought, pretty cool. So I got in the Googles, the Google, Googled all the things, and I wanted to show three frameworks for you guys. Uh, Social Engineering Toolkit, has anyone ever heard of that? Of course you have, <laughs> it's Dave's one. Uh, that was a failed joke, but anyhow, there's Fierce Fish, Go Fish, and I did play around with Cobalt Strike. There is some notes in there, which I did on the plane a couple of nights ago, so we might do that. So when I got these three tools, I downloaded them, what do you do next? You install them, you play around with them, and you decide on a preferred tool. But before we get to that, I wanted to show you a domain tool that a friend of mine showed me last night. When, when you're looking for domain names to make, you want one that's similar to the company or close to the pretext or a survey website. And this catfish tool is really cool because it will show you what domains are available, what aren't, and different different types, so it might be LinkedIn123, LinkedIn with a one, uh, Unicode and that sort of bypass stuff, which is actually pretty cool. So that was suggested by MKR underscore ultra. So see, Twitter really works, get on it. She's now uh, PowerPoint famous. So uh, do you want to take the photo again? <laughs> okay, uh, the different frameworks. So Fierce Fish, Go Fish. Oh, I had two slides of that. So the framework criteria after playing with it, a framework one has to send an email because it's a phishing framework. <laughs> Tracking email when it gets opened with an image is really helpful. You want to be able to clone a website and then save credentials. So that can either do it automatically or you can edit the, uh, the web page yourself and add the payload or whatnot. And then you want graphs and result recording. So you want to know how many emails you sent and you want really cool graphs because sea levels and whatnot, like all that stupid hocus pocus kind of stuff. Because in here it's an echo chamber, so I guess all you guys are real, really technical, but the execs really love like, oh, this, this little peak here meant this, and that color there in the pie graph meant that. I work at a big forest, so I have to deal with it a lot. So installation. Installing GoFish is downloading a binary in Linux, CH modding it, and running it. Literally. I um, didn't believe it when I read it, pre-built binaries, 
works like that. It's so easy. And the default credentials are admin and GoFish. You can change them, but for testing, you wouldn't bother. I'm out of water, damn it. Um, so you see hmod plus x, the GoFish binary, run it and installs, and it works. It's like the easiest thing other than downloading Kali and running the social engineering toolkit. So when it's installed, it looks like this. has a really nice dashboard, campaigns, users and groups, email templates. It's built in Go. It's really nice. Settings, setting profiles, landing pages. So Fierce Fish was originally Firefish. It's by a guy that worked at Mandiant, but he changed it to Fierce Fish because it was his own tool. So it was e more easily separate from FireEye or something. Fierce Fish is awesome, but it doesn't run in Kali rolling by default. And I don't know about you, but I love to use Kali Linux. All the tools are there, why not? Does anyone use Kali Linux here? Even do oh wow, awesome. I'd hope so. <laughs> but it just doesn't work in Kali, and it's like, why not? It would make so much sense to do that. But it runs by default in Ubuntu 16, and it's not as easy to install. There's a bit of a configuration file, which is good and bad, because it forces you to set up your website domain and then ensure all the settings are correct, and then do configured equals true, then it will download and install. Oh, I'm sort of playing one slide behind. Sorry, guys. Yeah, configured equals true. So then you run that, and it says, found that you were running on Ubuntu, and if it, it won't even try to install on Kali. And then it does a quick install. It runs it, blah, 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 blah. And then it will automatically do your external IP address. So in my case, 216172 at the time. So I went to go to that, and it didn't load, because I'm in a testing environment. So I'm my website domain was localhost, but it still used the external IP address. So just as a word of warning, when you do install it, do the uh, local address, and it works fine. And then you can log in and everything. So then the social engineering toolkit, who's played with it? For, for fun, even. Most of you guys. Awesome. So obviously, it's installed by installing Kali by default. It does. <laughs> Dave does give you a, you need to use this for good purposes, not bad, don't be an evil prick, click yes, and it works. No installing, it's pretty easy, works really well. So it's got a lot of options in the social engineering toolkit. Uh, for this talk, we're focusing on the social engineering attacks, obviously, which has spear phishing and different website attack vectors, which in that allow you to clone a website and do the spear phishing, which is pretty cool. So for each framework, the requirement was to send an email, track an email, clone the website, and results, which we went through before. So how many of you think the phishing frameworks can send an email? All of them. You'd hope so. So all of them send an email. For GoFish, it looks like this, just a new template. You can import an email. So with Google, you would save it, things like that. It's pretty awesome. You can create your own email as well. So Fierce Fish is as simple as well. Again, single email. You can create it yourself. Cobalt Strike, on the other hand, does not allow you to generate your own email and write the content. It forces you, because you're most likely phishing for a client engagement, to save the email and then import it. So your target's list is not handwritten one by one. It's actually a text file, and it can be comma delimited, things like that. You have your mail server, bounce email, things like that. But I was doing this on the flight, so I couldn't set that up and show you. But I wanted to show you the trial version of Cobalt Strike anyhow. So that, for tracking and opening email, Fierce Fish does not have that. GoFish and the Social Engineering Toolkit do, I think so. Uh, Cobalt Strike, I didn't have time to confirm again because I was on the plane and it wasn't set up. But in GoFish, it looks as simple as this. Add a tracking image, tick, done. It's really cool. So that what happens is when they open the email, you, your uh, framework says, hey, email was opened. And you sort of get a live picture of what's actually happening on the other end. Fierce Fish actually has some really cool things it records. So you are, you individual ID of the email and whatnot and the campaign and plan to send out, things like that. But it doesn't actually let you 
track the opening of it. So you guys will figure out which one you prefer. So cloning a website and saving credentials, fish, fish. It's meant to be a fully fledged phishing toolkit, but it doesn't allow you to do this, unfortunately. This is why I prefer GoFish, because you can. You can create your own page with HTML code, or you can copy it, import site, clone it, things like that. Social engineering toolkit, you can use a web template, you can clone the site, things like that. It's pretty, it's social engineering toolkit is awesome. So again, with Cobalt Strike, I was on the flight, didn't have the real internet, so you can clone a URL site, and I was just doing it to the local host, but I can't show you because it wouldn't download the host, but it's pretty easy to do. Again, Cobalt Strike is a paid tool, so for testing purposes, you might want to just stick with GoFish. And then graphs and result recording, they all do it. And Cobalt Strike probably has really amazing uh, reporting for it. So they're all good tools, and the links are in there to give it a go. So we've got the frameworks. We understand the email minefield. So practice, how do we practice? Well, I was able to find a virtual machine from Raphael Mudge. If you're just at home and want to do this, it's awesome. It's called Morning Catch. So it's just a virtual machine. You don't have to set up DNS. You don't have to set up a domain or anything. You can just go and play. So Morning Catch has a login page which you can practice cloning the web page, seeing what it looks like to, the, to you for when a user will actually uh, click the link, hopefully. So that's really important because you've got to test what it's like for them so you know what's coming up. And you can receive an email. So this is just a GoFish test email informing you that it was successful and the email was sent. So you can see what it looks like, play around, things like that. Now, when you send a phishing email with a link, some email uh, gateways or clients, sorry, will give you a pop-up saying, oh, it's got a link. You might want to enable the content. So even though this isn't real world, obviously, it gives you an idea of the things you might come up against when you're practicing or when you're doing the live testing. And I really like Morning Catch as well because it has different client-side vulnerabilities, Adobe, Flash, some Linux ones, but what Ra Raphael did was put Wine, and there's actually some really old Windows exploits, so you can do client-side attacks as well. So you set up a website with a malicious, maybe a Metasploit payload that's relevant. I think he's got it on his link as well. You can play and do it like that. It's almost like a mini OSCP in that way. So you might want to practice with that virtual machine, and that's all good, but then what about web pages, your domain? How do you practice that? Well, I could show you an amazing website that's like perfect and coded and everything, but we're learning here. So I created a digital ocean machine and just coded some different submissions, such as a name, last name, different download options. So with the download options, the reason I did that is because there's different ways to download and serve files or pages. You can link to another page and then download it, you can have the button serve the file, or you can use JavaScript to pop up a new page, things like that. And then there's, yeah, just all these different things. But the thing is, you need to practice so that you can see what there is and why. So I just popped up a digital ocean client machine uh, in the Toronto district. So I have a domain called Hex and Flex, because at the time I was doing my GXPN and going through assembly, so it was all Hex and yeah. So you do that, you set up a page, it runs through the internet, so it's sort of real world, and then you need a domain, and there's a lot of different domain registers. There's the Amazon, Route 53. I also had the Rebel, and so this is just a screenshot of the Amazon one with another domain called Pop the Pwn. So with your domain, you'll need to set it up to a name server, and this just all points to Amazon, and you might be like, hey, but your domain was set up in the cloud. Uh, I was silly and just left it pointing to Amazon, and then my Amazon Route 53 actually points to DigitalOcean's name servers, so it does a little back and forth between them. And then on my DigitalOcean machine, I hosted different payloads. 
So as you can see, I've got my download.php page, which will download. I've got different empire payloads. I've got my file.exe, which I was practicing on my work laptop, and it uh, set off an alarm because it's just an executable. It's not even obfuscated. And ITS contacted me and said, what's up? I was like, oops, sorry. <laughs> so clearly, that doesn't work. But then you can also bypass that with the Empire Shell, but I didn't say that. So with your, your website and domains, just practice, code it up, because you want to know what's going on in the background, how it's served up. Now, we come to different payloads. So you've got the website, you've got the virtual machine, you want to practice different payloads, right? So I wanted to show you guys the HTA file, Microsoft Click Once, which I saw on a B-Sides video, and I thought it was awesome, and DLL files. So the HTA application is a HTML application. It can run different types of code inside it. It's just basically a HTML application has like a HTML website, and it can run JavaScript, for example. So it's just tags added to JavaScript. To create this, I used uh, PowerShell Empire. And then I set a listener on port 80. I just named it test80, because why not? Named the HTA file, test.hta. You might want to name it something else when it's live, because that's not really going to pass anyone's common sense. So we wrote it out to just a HTML directory. And then I want to show you guys, if you actually cat the HTA file, it's literally just HTML code with script launching a PowerShell code, a PowerShell payload which is pretty cool. And then it has the PowerShell not bypass, like no execution bypass. And then at the end, at the bottom, it has the wscript.shell run. And you can probably customize that and everything, but I thought that was a pretty cool way to see that when you actually click HTA execute, what does that actually mean? So then when I was testing, I just made a download page with an update, and then it downloads. So with this one, as you can see, some older code, but the PHP header is really good. It's just the location of the file, and it pushes it to your user to download. So with the uh, HTA file, the interaction is on a Windows 10 box with Internet Explorer to open or save it. So hopefully the uh, user will click open. But there is a second user interaction where they then say, oh, this program wants to run something again. And you're like, what? Why? You have to allow it a second time. So that makes you more aware of what the user actually has to do with this certain payload. And then it actually pops up a PowerShell screen. So if you go back here, I've highlighted in red the dash W hidden, which means hide the window. But for some reason on my Windows 10 machine, I don't know if maybe it was just my cracked Windows 10, but it pops up the Windows PowerShell. It doesn't actually run code, it, it just pops up, and that would alert someone, especially if you're at work and you see that pop up, what the hell. So with this payload, there's actually three different interactions. So you might want to try something else. But once you go through all that, you receive your shell, and with PowerShell uh, Empire, it, it says nice and green, you've received an agent. It's pretty cool. <coughs> oh, crap, getting tight on time. So I wanted to also show you the DLL. Empire also has a DLL functionality. And it's just a reflective DLL. And then you add it to a file, test.dll again. You set the listener, you execute it, you write to a file. Then this one, I use the header as well. And then what the user actually sees is the, would you like to save the DLL file? You click OK. But because it's a DLL file, it doesn't just execute in a normal way. So with DLL files, they have an uh, in entry point or an instruction point. And generally, you'll have to use run dll 32exe to execute it. And with the Empire one, I couldn't actually get it to work because I didn't know the entry point name. I looked at the documentation. I couldn't find it. But the importance here is that a DLL requires more interaction to actually be executed than a simple HTA file. And then I did some Googling, and I wanted to test if the DLL was right or not. So there's a way within Metasploit to use a, a DLL stager, and then you browse to it, and it's just a client-side attack and runs a DLL. But it wouldn't work on Windows 10. So it's probably a Windows 10 issue. 
no, it'll be a user issue. But it's just to show you that when you're learning, these things happen and mistakes get made. And it's better to practice them beforehand so you, again, can know what's happening. So I think I only have time for uh, this last one payload. But the Microsoft Click Once is awesome. It's this Microsoft designed idea to help IT admins or staff deploy updates across the whole network and reduce the user interaction required. So it's called Click Once because your, uh, your employee has to click once and it executes and runs. So that's pretty awesome. So yeah, self-updating self Windows-based applications that can be installed and run with minimal user in interaction, which is awesome. But us being the red team or pen testers, we're like, yes, perfect advantage to exploit it or use it. So it works up to Windows 7. It does require Internet Explorer. So if you're like me and you use Mozilla or Chrome or you just hate IE, it's not going to work. Windows 8 has something called a smart screen filter, so it requires more of a signed certificate, so it won't work. There are ways to bypass the URL, but I just wanted to show you the easy way. So the way the payload works is it's a C-sharp application in a certain framework, and you can add things to it. So in this one, it's just calc.exe, but when you build it with Visual Studio, it comes out with five different files, and then you need to actually save it within the slash COA directory from Microsoft to understand that it's actually, that it's actually a click once application. So you have your application files, your click once test dot application has your setup.exe, which comes as part of the uh, C sharp when you're building it, which is pretty cool. There's actually a link in the other slide to show this. So it's pretty easy to do. So the user interaction using JavaScript with window.open makes it like a click thrice or twice or something. So when you use JavaScript, Internet Explorer blocks it. Unknown domain or IP address, okay, allow once, that's fine. You get a second pop-up, do you want to open this? Yeah, okay, it's for, it's for my work, why do I have to do this again? And then there's a third freaking pop-up saying, do you want to run this? So it's not a click once when you use JavaScript, which was really frustrating. There's too many things to click, users become suspicious, especially if it's a w update, it's going to be easy, just click once, run type of payload, but that's not what happens. So I used PHP, and click once worked much better. So I just delivered it to a download.php page. So when you go to the website, It'll be like, oh, you've signed in. Please click here to download the payload. And then within PHP, I use the header. So you do the location as a COA directory, then the click once test dot application, which is pretty cool. And then this time, your user interaction is just simply run the payload. It's like, oh, that's from work. There's no alerts, so it should work. So then you get your calc.exe payload, which is pretty cool. So that was just showing the click once, the DLL, and the HTA files. So you guys can practice at home. And I was actually lucky. I was able to do that pretty quickly and get through it all. So the key takeaways were consider the user interaction and the technology to bypass the email minefield. Do the, do the hard work so that when you actually do fish for a shell, you're going to be more successful. And things aren't going to work the way you think they are try and test and think, think outside the square. Uh, that's about all I had. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions and comments? Yep. Uh, just a quick question. In your opinion, uh, you know, we were talking about HTA files, also, uh, um, what would be a payload that you could use in a user case yep. um, that is uh, non-toxic but useful for exploiting the processes to be Oh, like in a security awareness program, and then it pops up something? Is that what you mean? Or just a... Um, so with the uh, security awareness, yeah, like a, when you click the link, and it, it's a website that says, hey, you clicked the link, it could have been malicious. You can use a payload that probably just does a pop-up, like a JavaScript pop-up, or in C code, alert, and then it says, hey, this is a malicious binary, this was a phishing email. It would just be a benign payload. Basically, so instead of getting a reverse shell, it would alert the user of what's actually happened.
That's all right. Or you could use uh, <laughs> Empire Agents Troll Sploit, which makes like everything turn upside down and stuff. It'll be fun. <laughs>